Amen. All right, well, look, we're going to read this whole chapter right here. This is Exodus chapter 25. Uh, this is the early days of the nation of Israel, okay? So we got Old Testament time before there was a nation called Israel. You know, God created Adam and Eve and raised. God was already showing us that he already knew. That he wasn't taken by surprise. He already had a plan in place according to what Peter tells us in the New Testament that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but instead with the precious blood of the Lamb which was foreordained before the, even the foundation of the earth. So what that tells us is that God knew what was going to happen in advance and that he already had a plan in place and that the plan has been very progressive. I want you to know that. And you can find common themes Throughout the scripture, at uh, Jeff and, and Angie's wedding, I mentioned the fact that wedding is, is a theme throughout the scripture because Jesus is the bridegroom and, and, the, and the Bible says that you and I are the bride and there's going to be this great coming together of the wedding to the, of the lamb. Amen. But, but I want you to see too in, in my message this morning, it's about presence and, and, and it's about the presence of God. And, and you and I need to understand that when sin came in, it changed everything. It changed the connection between God and man. It changed the connection that God had intended as far as for presence with his people. Okay, and so where we are in the time frame is, is that man has been created, man has fallen into sin, the flood has taken place, the tower, the rebellion at the Tower of Babel has taken place, and then God called Abraham, and he told Abraham, he said, listen, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. He gave Abraham a promise. Now, it didn't come to pass for hundreds of years. This is all documented in Old Testament scriptures. These, these scriptures are well over 2,000 years old, okay? So, I mean, they're really close to 4,000 years old. The Old Testament scriptures are close to 4,000 years old. This, this is not, this didn't happen in some back alley somewhere. Yeah, man, the truth of Jesus, but I'm here to tell you, God, and you know what, he, what God told Abraham is this. He said, your people that are going to be your descendants for 400 years, they're going to be slaves. And that's exactly what happened. The children of Israel became slaves in the nation of Egypt which is a type of the world. Listen, the enemy, like Pharaoh, wants to <coughs> enslave God's people. See, God said, told, told Moses, he said, you bring your brother Aaron with you, he'll be your mouthpiece. I know you don't feel confident, but listen, you bring your brother Aaron and you tell Pharaoh, let my people go so that they might worship me. You let my people go so that they might go into the wilderness and they might worship me. See, the enemy of your soul, the enemy of humanity's soul, does not want God's people to be able to be free so that they can go and worship him. So that they can offer their lives back unto him. All right? And so, listen, no, God, God showed Pharaoh who the boss was. And in the end, he's going to show Satan who the boss is. And he wants to show Satan who the boss is right now in your life. Amen. Okay, one day God's going to turn this whole thing around and he, we're going to see who the true king is of this rock we call earth. In the meantime, he wants to start with you. Amen. You, mama. He wants to start with you. Mike, he wants to start with you. Charito, he wants to start with you. Matt. He wants to start with me. This little piece of geography right here. He wants to get a hold of this. He wants to be the king of this right here. He wants to start right here. And he, and he wants to keep working his way out. He wants that light to keep shining. Amen. Amen. Look, the enemy tried to, steal, tried to steal Israel. That little piece of land right there. And, you know, he tried to steal that little piece of land right there. But as soon as he thinks he's moving... God, God done flipped the script. God done turned it into a new covenant. And now his presence doesn't have, we're going to talk about it a little bit. His presence doesn't even live in a tent anymore. It lives in a tent called you. And now there's hundreds, there's millions of them yes. all over the place. Yes. Little lights shining all over this globe that are being a reflection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be, church. Amen. I'm telling you right now, I say it all the time, and I need to get into my message. But look, your purpose on this earth is not to be the best doctor, not to be the best golfer, not to be the best businessman, not to be the best da 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 da. Your goal or your purpose on this, this little vapor called life is to make a decision for Jesus to let the pre I'm telling you, that's God's purpose for you. If God, if God is real, I use the conjunction if because not everybody agrees with me. Maybe somebody watching on video don't even believe in God. 
If God is real, I'm convinced, my friend, he's done revealed himself to me. Amen. You can't take away my testimony. Right. You can't take away the testimony of some dude that was a high school dropout sitting on an air conditioner waiting for somebody to bring some weed so he could get a high, waiting for somebody to give him two bucks so he can buy a quart of beer just so he can get a little bit of a buzz. And then God show up one day and change it. No, 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 no. People all tell me, what you did for yourself? Because I'll tell them. No, you don't even know. Right. You don't even know what I used to be. Oh, but look what you did for yourself. No, you miss it, sir. I appreciate that, you know? I appreciate you trying to give me a compliment, but I'm here to tell you, let me look you in the eyeballs. It's Jesus. Yes. And that ain't picked himself oh, up by the bootstraps. Oh, no, the Lord showed up and did something in me. And I'm here. I know what my yes. purpose is, friend. Yes. My purpose is to give him glory everywhere that he brings me. Every minute of every day. Now, do I always hit it right? No. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. But I'm telling you, that's what our purpose is. So he created a nation called Israel. And through Israel, he provided a way to give his presence to them. And his purpose in that was that the world around Israel as a nation would be able to see his goodness. Doesn't that sound familiar? He said, because from Israel comes Christian. And for, through Jesus, and Christian is supposed to do the same for the world around them. So where we are right now is, is that the children of Israel have left Egypt, and they're in the Exodus. And God is telling Moses, build me a place where I can live. I want you to build me a place where I can live. You know, I didn't plan on saying this right here, but you know, I'm grateful that God gave us a place. I mean, listen, really and truly, the place is supposed to be your heart. Amen. It's supposed to be my heart. But God gave us a building. Right now, God shows up for people to congregate, the people of God to come together to worship. And that's what church is really supposed to be. It's not really supposed to be a social gathering. I mean, you know that we, there's social aspects to it because we have fellowship and communion and relationship with one another. But, but this house is supposed to be a place where those that have a common union, which is in Christ through faith in what he did, we come together and we worship him. Amen. And we and we and we get we get fed and discipled by his word. Amen. And his word changes us. And then we take what we receive and we go out into the world and we bring that love, that light with us into a darkened world that is lost. That's what it's supposed to be, my friend. Does the church look that like that overall everywhere? I know I complain about, but I'm just I'm just a realist. No, it doesn't. Because that's usually not not the real intent of what people are doing in the modern church today. But that's enough. God wants to reveal himself to a lost world. And so when we see this Exodus passage, it's a long chapter. I'm going to read through it. What I want you to know is all these minute details you know, my wife, Danielle, some of you may not know that, but she's very crafty. She loves to do craft stuff, okay? And she's, she's really good at it. I think she is, anyway. And, um, and I'm kind of, like, harsh on people. <laughs> like, I don't always go around telling people that I'm really critical in my mind, but I think she's really good at that kind of stuff. But anyway, she was reading some of this stuff about the tabernacle the other day, and she was like, God was so crafty. <laughs> Meaning, he put so much intricate detail yeah. Into the tabernacle. And listen, in many ways, and we don't have time to really break it down, but I got to tell you, in many ways, these articles of this tabernacle all point to Christ. All point to Christ, point to the relationship between believer and Christ. And I'll point some of that out as we read, but I just want you to know that, that that's what you see in this physical structure known as the tabernacle, which was the original tent before the temple was made that was built by Solomon, that they wandered in the wilderness with this tent. It was mobile. They set it up when the Lord told them to set it up. They tore it down when the Lord told them to tear it down. They went where God told them to go. Amen. Uh, and, and that was the plan of God. All right, so here we go. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. You know, I can't even really get too far without stopping right there. I mean, did you just see that? You got to have a willing heart to give to the Lord. Yes. Yeah, you know, look, most preachers would be up here like, you know, give your money to the Lord. And I want you to, I want you to do what the word of God says. The word of God says to pay your tithes. 
I didn't make that up, but I'm not going to really hound on that. What, what I want you to know is you ain't doing nobody any good if you don't give to the Lord willingly. Out of a heart that wants to give to God. Now, you can still do it out of obedience. And I do believe that God in the end will still bless you. Many times just by changing your heart over the years. Because you're desiring to do what God's called you to do. But Lord, I want to be to the place where I give unto you willingly. Like where my heart has a desire to give back to you. Because if my heart's in that place, you know what it means? You have revealed to me, oh Lord, how, how nothing that I have that I would have if it were not for you. Do you believe that this morning? Or do you believe that you were just so smart, so slick, so cool, so moving and shaking, shucking and jiving that you just got it all done on your own? Do you believe that way? I hope you don't believe that way this morning. I hope you believe that the Lord is the one that gave you the gifts. And listen, if you'll start to give him glory, I'm telling you right now, he'll bless you even more. Amen. All right. So if you're going to give, ask the Lord to give you a heart that wants to give willingly. Amen. And I got to tell you that what, what all this stuff that he's wanting to give is for the purpose of this house that he wants to live in. So when you give to the church, you're, we're, what we're doing is... We're building the house of God. And what was going on at this house, we're going to talk about it a little bit, was the ministry for God. The offering up of sacrifices, the forgiveness of the, the, the covering of the people's sins. Okay, the ministry of the sacrifice. That's the same thing that's going on in the house of God today. Or at least it's the same thing that's supposed to be going on in the house of God today. The ministry of the Lord. We're supposed to be ministering unto God. And guess what? It still takes finances to do it. I don't need your golden earrings and I don't need your bracelets. But what we do need is we need, we need to give into the house of God. Amen. And I mean, I'm not telling you something that I don't do myself. Amen. All right. Well, let's keep reading. If he's willing to give it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them. Gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And goat's hair. And ram skins dyed red. And badger skins. And shittim wood. Oil for the light. Spices for anointing oil. And for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod. And in the breastplate. That had something to do with what the high priest wore. And let them make me a sanctuary. That's another word for a tent. That I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, another word for tent, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. Chris, would you do me a big favor? Would you go in that room and look on that bookshelf and get that little stick that your mama bought me when she went on her trip? You'll see it. It's, it's, it, it looks like a, it's a stick that's sitting on the edge of the bookshelf. All right, so let's go back and let's read that. And they shall make an ark of shit of wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Thank you, sir. So this is a cubit. Miss uh, Angela and Aaron and Chari went to that is Kentucky, right? The Ark thing. And this is this is this whole thing is considered a long Hebrew cubit. Is that what how they call it? A long Hebrew cubit. So basically, whenever they built the Ark, let's see here. I didn't think to do all this, but it just hit me while I was doing it. Two cubits and a half. One, two, and then a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit, and a half the breadth thereof, and, uh, and a cubit, and a half the height thereof, okay? And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold. It was supposed to be the measurement between your AC fossa, which is kind of by your elbow and your fingertip, but as you can see, I am definitely not a long Hebrew human, right? <laughs> anyway, that's the measurements. And so at least you get a visual of what it kind of looked like. And you shall overlay it with pure gold within and without shall you overlay it. And shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it and put them in the four corners thereof. And two rings 
shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side, and you shall make staves, that's another word for a pole, of shit and wood, and overlay them with gold, and you shall put the staves, or the poles, into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. Now, we're, we're not talking about this right now, but this is, God was very specific on how he wanted this ark toted. Because I told you, this is a portable tent. And whenever, he said, listen, that's when I believe that song comes from. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move, you got to move, you got to move. And, and he said, listen, when the pillar of cloud by day stays still, set up the tent. When the pillar of cloud or the fire by night begins to move, pack up the tent and let's get to moving, right? And so, but when it came time to carry the ark, they had rings, golden rings on the side of this box that I just showed you the measurements thereof. And you had poles of made overlaid with gold and they went through the rings and that the priests would bear the ark like that, carrying the literal presence of God with them. They weren't supposed to touch it. If you'll remember back in the day, whenever David said, let us go get the ark. Listen, I want you to know before we get going good, the ark is the presence of God. And, and, and it says that whenever they went to go get the ark, Uzziah tried to stabilize it. The, they put it in a cart and they had it drawn by animals and it went down a, into a pothole. Okay, And Uzziah, Uzziah thought he was going to stabilize it and he was struck dead. And, the, and David was weeping. What have we done? He said, you better go back to the word of the Lord, son. You better go back to the word of the Lord and you better realize how you're going to handle my presence. And, 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 and so, you know what they did was, if you remember the story, I'll never forget. I always got to give Ross credit for this. When he came and he preached that message and he said, do you see the trail of blood? Because the word of the Lord says when they brought the presence back, you see, people are like, I don't see the cross throughout the scripture. Well, you ain't reading it right, my friend. Because whenever David brought the presence of the Lord back to the house of God, listen, I've been in the church a long time. They say, this is how we usher in the presence of the Lord. We're going to sing. See, David danced in the presence. No, no, no. David danced because the presence of the Lord showed up. How did he get the presence of the Lord there? Every six paces. Did you know that man was created on the sixth day? So that the number six represents man. And did you know that at the time of David, man was fallen ever since the time of Adam. And so whenever you're looking at the number six, it's lacking completion. We're about to get into that in a second. And the number seven is the time of fulfillment. It's the time of rest because God has done it. He's done the labor, amen, and he comes to rest. Jesus is the final fulfillment of rest. Jesus is the seventh. Jesus is the Sabbath. Jesus is what makes mankind complete. But look, six is incomplete. And guess what? Every six paces, they offered up a sacrifice. Every six paces coming all the way back from where the ark was to where it made it finally to Jerusalem for its first time to ever be there. Every six paces an animal was slaughtered and his blood spilt upon the ground. And I'll never forget when Ross said it. Do you see the trail of blood? Because see, it's a constant reminder, my friend, that mankind. But God has a beautiful plan. And within all of this, God's plan. Is slowly being materialized. They didn't even really know the fulfillment of it in that time. We don't even know. We got some answers in the word of God. But we don't really know what God has planned. Staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. What's the testimony? It's, the, it's, the, it's also known as the ark of the covenant. covenant. It's the tablets. The tablets of stone. The law. The ten commandments. It's the word of God. It, it's the word of God. It's, it's how God communicates to his people. Those people that are called by his name, he communicates through his word to them. That's how he communicates. And now you and I have access to the spirit of God to really understand the word of God. And he put that in that box. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof. And a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, 
covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be and thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony the two tablets the law the word of god that i shall give thee and there i will meet with you and i will commune with you from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand breadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings again of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves or the poles so that they can bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves or poles of shit and wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. I did not really hammer this point home, but I want to stop here for a second. So there's a table, and we're going to look at some pictures to try to get this across a little bit better. But there's a golden table on the inside of the tabernacle. And on this golden table, there's something called showbread. And, 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 and the main the idea of the showbread is also known as bread of presence. Sometimes in the Hebrew culture, they would call it face bread. Kind of like the idea of face time. It's like the Lord said, this bread of presence is supposed to be before me always. Okay. The, the, the high priest, every seventh day, the only kind of work that really happened on the seventh day uh, uh, was, was that the bread was exchanged. The bread was changed out, and, 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 and it was in six, six it was 12, uh, 12 loaves total that was in two stacks of six. So 12 represented the 12 tribes of Israel, six represented the man. They, they were going, I believe, the, I'll shoot from the hip here, but there was four of them. Two of them were holding the new stuff. Two of them grabbed the old stuff, they took it off, and they put the other two on there real quick. And then the priest would eat the bread in the presence of the Lord. Face bread. This presence is, this bread is to be before me always. It's a reminder that God wants to be with his people. It's a reminder that God wants to have relationship with his people. It's a reminder that there was going to be one day, or there was one day, when the bread of presence showed up from heaven on earth. Amen. And that God gave us Jesus. All right. And thou shalt make a candlestick. It's also known as the menorah. Okay. Of pure gold of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knots, his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches, there's that number of man again, shall come out of the sides of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side, three bowls made like unto almonds with a knot and a flower in one branch and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knot and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knots and their flowers. And there shall be a knot under two branches of the same and a knot under two branches of the same. And a knop under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knops and their branches shall be of the same, and it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light. Did you notice that? There's three branches on one side, three branches on the other side, and there's one in the middle for a total of seven. And they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. Other translations say, give light in front of it. Don't, look, don't get tired on me now. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? We're talking about the presence of God. 
and the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. Praise God. So here's the word of the Lord. Amen. And here's the plan of God. And so my message this morning, like I told you, the progression of his presence. I want to try to communicate with you this morning the fact that God is committed to getting his presence back to his people. Amen. In this one particular scripture that really sticks out to me, and I'll never forget this particular scripture, how it talks about, and he said it, let them make me a sanctuary. Let them make me a tabernacle. Let them make me a tent, a resting place. Why? So that I may dwell among them. What I want you to know is, is that God wants his presence to be with his people. And listen, we need to start thinking of the overall plan of God. When God created Adam and Eve, his plan was that they would multiply on the earth and that his presence would be with mankind. But sin changed all of that. Sin caused a change to take place where the presence of God could no longer constantly be with mankind. But I got to tell you that his desire is not to leave us alone. His desire is for his presence to be given back to us so that he can heal us, so that we can have a relationship with him, and so that he can use us to get his work done. In this scripture right here, we're going kind of back to the beginning. Okay, I'm going backwards to move forward. In Genesis 3.22, the Lord God said, Behold the man, this is after they ate. This is after they ate the forbidden fruit that God told them not to. Okay, and behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, I want you to see that another translation says, real quick, the, the bolded part, he must not be allowed to reach out his hand and eat from the tree of life. So basically, God was saying, because of the sin that they've done, and now that they know good and evil, there's been a change that's take pl taken place. There's a lot. This stuff is so deep, but we don't have time to go there this morning. There, there's a change that has taken place in the human heart and the human mind to where now there has to be a change that takes place to the longevity of their life. He cannot continue to be sustained by the tree of life now because the wages of sin is death. Therefore, he must, here it goes, God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from where he was taken. I want you to see the scripture here. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. In other words, God said because of your disobedience, a change has to take place between my relationship with you. Because of the sin in your life, I cannot be in close proximity to you. I cannot walk with you, Adam, anymore in the cool of the day the way that we used to. Listen to me, church. People don't like to hear a message like this, but God has to judge sin. Sin is in opposition to God. And listen, for you to understand this today, that sin in your life and sin in my life today, it still will affect us. Yet, that is free from sin. Jesus died to forgive us of sin. But the more sin we have in our life, the further away we tend to be from the presence of the Lord. We, our heart becomes hard. We, we don't, we don't, we're not as sensitive to the presence of the Lord. We're not as sensitive to wants to do what it wants to do. And the spirit is over here wanting to contend with us. But because we're in rebellion against God, we don't want to hear what God has to say. We want self to win. Now listen, so he says, that's not going to work for me. I mean, can, can I just be real? God is like, this is not going to work for me. But, but fret not, I have a plan. But right now the plan means you have to be driven from the Garden of Eden. And now I want you to see this. He put cherubim. So I want you to see that this is the first time the Bible mentions cherubims. You know, Cher cherubims, I think Aaron might have mentioned some of this in his message. 
It's a form of an angel. This is the best that we can understand. It's a form of an angel. And when they had flaming swords and they were guarding the entranceway back into the Garden of Eden. So basically, these cherubims were protecting the garden where the presence of God was located. Where God was saying, you cannot have entryway back into here. So the first time that we see the concept of the cherubims, they're preventing access to the presence of God. I think that that's interesting, and I'm going to explain to you why. So here's one artist's depiction of what it may have looked like. A big angel with a sword. I don't know why it's not lit up, but it's not. And Adam and Eve in sorrow walking away from the garden. All right? But I want you to see there's some other concepts of cherubim. You may not be able to tell, but right there, uh, these are angels. These angels right here, you see this is this is an angel with his, with his wings lifted up, and then this is an angel upside down. This is just one art in the tabernacle would have looked like. Nobody knows for sure. All we know is that cherubims were also embroidered into the curtain of the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. Okay, so again, we see this concept of having to do with the presence of God, right? Okay, here's, a, um, here's a, another, um, uh, th this is the most famous place where the cherubims were located. You may not have remembered, but when we were talking about the Ark of the Covenant, and we were talking about the building of it, and the mercy seat, he said, let there be two cherubim, and they were on each side of the mercy seat, and they were facing towards one another, and their wings were spread towards one another, but if you'll notice, you may not be able to see it in their hands, but the scripture specifically says, and let their eyes be faced towards one another, but down at the mercy seat. Now there's a whole a lot of deep theology in all of that. Because I'm not going to get into it real deep, but what you got to remember what was on the inside of the ark the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And I got to tell you that Israel did not keep the law of God. So what you see is it's a place of judgment because the law is broken. But guess what? Every year, they, we're going to talk about it, they sprinkle blood right there. Now, I want you to think about this. See, again, People are like, I don't always see the cross. See, no matter how deep you get, and you need to dig deep. You need to understand the word of the Lord because there's meaning in this. And what I need to tell you is, is that while the law was broken, because Israel couldn't keep it, and you sure didn't, and I know I didn't, that even though the law was broken, once a year, God sent the high priest, and we're going to talk about it, into that place. And you know what he did? He sprinkled, that's what the King James says. The King James says he sprinkled blood on top of that mercy seat. I kind of like the way the ESV says it. It says they throw it. <laughs> throw the blood on the mercy seat. They throw the blood seven times upon the mercy seat. Now it goes from a place to a place of mercy. What changed it? What was the game changer? An innocent animal died? And the blood of an innocent animal was applied to the top of the mercy seat where now the cherubim, instead of viewing broken law, view the blood of an innocent animal, a type of the forerunner that was the broken law in me. But when I said, yes, Lord, I accept your sacrifice, he applied blood on the mercy seat of my heart. Amen. And he changed me. Praise God. And now his presence can be with me. So that's, that's the cherubim. But look at this. This is interesting stuff right here. Ezekiel 28, 14. You are the anointed cherub that covers, and I have set thee so, you were upon the holy mountain of God. Here's the rest of the story. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until, <coughs> until what? Until iniquity was found in you. You know what he's talking about right there? He's talking about the enemy of God. He's talking about Satan before his fall. He's talking about the one that they call Lucifer. The, 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 okay. And what he's saying is this. He's saying you were the anointed cherub. See, Lucifer, before his, he, was a, he was a cherub. He was that form of an angel. And, it, and he's connected to the presence of God. And, and what I want you to see is, is that I don't even know that I completely understand all the ramifications and all the symbology that God is using these types after the fall of having a cherubim. And it looks like the cherubim is preventing access to the presence of God. But what we're about to see is, is that God makes it real clear that this is where I'm going to meet with you on that top of that mercy seat between them cherubim. And I think that moving forward, I'm, I'm going to try to have 
in the future some nights on a Sunday if we want to come together and to, to try to study a concept that I'm starting to see more and more in the word of the Lord that has to do with the fact that and it's only people that want to come and it'll be in the future yeah. and what he's trying to steal from God and, and the whole concept in the word of God that this thing is so much bigger than our personal lives listen God wants to fix your personal life God wants to give grace to you. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to give you stability. But you know what? He wants to do that for his purpose so that he can get glory, not just so that you and I can have prosperity. He'll, he's willing to give you prosperity if, he can, if you can handle it, but that's not what your purpose on earth is for. Our purpose is to be fulfilled in giving God glory. See, the enemy is trying to steal God's glory. I want you to see that. You are in a war, Christian. I remember some, one time a wise man told me, you need to not be so militaristic. I don't think so. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I agree with almost 99% of what that person said. I don't agree with that. We are in a war, a spiritual war, and we need to understand that. It may not fill the, the chairs of the church, but I got to tell you that that is really what's happening here. Amen. And that the enemy is trying to steal <clears throat> the ground of yeah. But God has placed his spirit in you, and he's taking it back. I went to the enemy's camp. And I, I took back what he stole from me. Amen? Amen. I took back what he stole from me. See, he wants you to be able, through the grace of God and through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, to take back from the enemy what he stole from you, so that in you and through you, he can take back what the enemy stole from him. Does God need you or me to take back what the enemy stole? No, to be honest with you, he doesn't. With one little flick of his finger, it's all done. He has chosen to use you and me. If we willingly, I'm not talking about paying any tithes right now, but it's a similar concept. If we with a willing heart will allow him to use us in that way. Oh, but I got too many things to do, preacher. I got YouTube videos to watch. I got Snapchats to do. I got, you know, F Facebook to play around on. I got to take some selfies. And I got to post my selfies, man. I got some self stuff I got to do. I got cars to buy and houses to build. And I got children that I got. And they're going to have grandchildren. I got picket fences to put up and dogs to groom. And I got all this stuff that I got to do. I just don't have. just got a little bit of room for the Lord. And I'm telling you right now, that's not God's will. <laughs> Is there anything wrong? Okay, let me not even get into that. All right, here we go. Let's just keep on going. There's an enemy of God. I want you to see that. But look what the Lord said right there. Exodus 25, 8. You might not even be able to read it. It's small, so let me read it for you. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Hallelujah. Make me a tent. Make me a place where my presence can dwell and live because I want to have a relationship with you. Yes, the fall of Adam caused cherubim to prevent their access back into the presence of God. But if you'll build me a tent, Moses, my presence will show up and I'll be with my people. And you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length. A cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And you shall make two cherubims of gold of beaten work. Shall you make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. Hallelujah. And there I will meet with you. And I will commune with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things, which I will give you in commandment unto the children of Israel. See, I know it's deep, and I know it's a lot of words, and I know it's a lot of concepts, and I know it's a lot of teaching, but you got to get it. You got to get how committed God is to this plan that he has, and you got to see the, the core. Yeah, we can say it's all about the cross, and it is. But what does that mean? What, 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 are you, what are you talking about? You're just talking about two pieces of wood. No, it's all about the cross. It's all about the sacrifice. And he's creating a picture right here. See, it's all about the presence. See, God dwells amongst righteousness. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you righteous this morning? Yeah, you are actually, if you're saved. If you're saved, you're righteous this morning. Not because you did it all right, my friend. Come on now. Don't be playing games with the Lord. He sees everything. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. 
But if you are saved this morning, you are, whether you feel righteous or not, my friend, if you have ever truly with your heart said, Lord, I believe in you and I want you to come into my heart and to save me because I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe you died on the cross for my sin. If you said it and you meant it and you felt the change in your heart, even if it was for a moment, and now when you do bad stuff, the Lord convicts you. I got a, I got a feeling that you're saved, my friend. Amen. I got a feeling that the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Now the enemy's trying to steal it from you. Right. But I got a feeling you're saved. And if you're saved this morning, guess what? The word of the Lord says you're righteous. Yeah. The word of the Lord says you're righteous. Not because you did it right. No. Because Jesus. Amen. And when you put faith in Christ, guess what? The Lord says he clothed you Hallelujah. with the righteousness of Jesus. So now when God the Father looks at you, he no longer looks at your failure. He no longer looks at your sin. He sees the righteousness of Jesus. If you'll start to believe that, you'll start to walk in some freedom. Yeah. Because you know what? You know what's going to overwhelm your heart? The goodness of God. Yeah. When you start to realize that in spite of yourself, at least that's what's happened to me. When I started to realize that in spite of myself. In spite of my failure, in spite of my transgression, in spite of my rebellion, God loved me. And when he made me realize, son, it's not, you're trying to work this. You're trying to earn this. You're trying to make yourself righteous in my eyes. And what I'm trying to tell you is, I've already made you righteous through my son. Just trust in my plan and rest in that. And when you will, you're going to get something in return. Grace. To strengthen you. Amen. Yeah. To live right. So he said I'm going to meet right there. I'm going to meet with you. I'm about to talk to you about it. But build me a tent. Put a veil up. And behind that veil put this ark. And in that ark put the, put the law. And on top of that ark put the mercy seat. That has the two cherubim on there. And once a year the high priest will go in there. And he's going to throw blood on top of that mercy seat. And there will I meet with you. Between the cherubim upon the mercy seat. Then I will commune with you. Here we go. Here's a picture of it. Now this is a this is an open version of the picture of the te of the temp temp tabernacle. You see right here in the beginning of it, you got the altar of sacrifice over here to the left. You can't really see this too well, but this would have been the bronze laver where the high where the, the priests would wash themselves. You can't see this, but this is where the lampstand was that we talked about. And this is the table of showbread. This is the altar of incense. But what I really want you to see is this right here. See, this is the veil. That's the veil. Because we're going to talk about the veil in a moment. But look, you can't see it because it's blurry. But look, this is the Ark of the Covenant. It was behind the veil. This is giving you a, an inner view of an overall picture of what's going on right there. But I want you to see this. Oh, look at me. Here, I did it. I did it. There we go. All right. Here's another picture. You can see the animals there, but that's for sacrifice. This is the altar here in the, in the bronze labor. But look, this is an internal view right here of the inside of the, of the tabernacle. Now, this is one artist's rendition. You can see a little bit better here. The, um, the, I must have done some drawing on my own here. This is, the, this is the table of showbread right here. You see these loaves of bread. We talked about that with the poles. You see that? This is the lampstand over here. Now, what's interesting to me is, is that you got this one in the middle, and then you got three on each side. And again, I made the comment, six is the number of man. But with that one in the middle, Jesus said in the book of Revelation that I am the one that stands in the midst of the candlesticks. And he said that the candlesticks were the churches. Right. See, the number six is incomplete, but whenever you connected to Jesus right there in the middle, he shares his light with you. Amen. We now are the light of the world. And that whole purpose of the light was to light up the area. But what I really wanted you to see, this is the altar of incense. It's, be it's before the veil. But this is the veil right here. You see that? And behind that veil right there is where the Ark of the Covenant was located. And I just wanted you to be able to, to see that right there for a second. All right? Because we're going to move forward. And the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron, your brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place. Now, the holy place is that place beyond the veil, the holy of holies. He's saying to Moses, tell Aaron and his boys that they can't just walk up behind the veil anytime that they want to. Because you can't just come access my presence at that time, anytime that you want to. Good news, good news. We're going to get into it. You 
have access anytime you want right now to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen. But right now they didn't because his presence is progressing. The progression of God's presence. Mankind, because of sin, was cast out of the garden. But now God is slowly and methodically bringing his presence back to his people. Because listen, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God has a plan. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Hallelujah. And upon this rock I will build my church. And the gate, it, listen to me, it's not the church. It's not the church, it's the Christ of the church. Yeah. It's the rock that the church is built upon, amen? And it's through that that God is going to prove himself to be true. He's going to prove his power on this earth. And the church starts with you, my friend. He says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron your brother, that he comes not at all times into the holy place, within the veil, before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat. Remember how we talked about that, that little censer? Remember I showed y'all a picture of that recently? And how the high priest would have to bring that censer with the coals in it, burning incense. Kind of like in the, I told y'all, like in the, in the Catholic funeral. It's a, that, that little thing that they swing around. That's what it was. It was a censer. It's a portable altar of incense. Whatever you think about all that, I'm just trying to tell you that, that is a, that's what it was. How he's swinging and then the arrow filled with smoke. He had to bring that in there with him. And the purpose was to shield him from the presence of the Lord. He says, and he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord. That the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat. That is upon the testimony that he died not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it. ESV version, throw it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Again, the number seven, completion, fulfillment, blood applied to the mercy seat between the cherubim. Where the presence of the Lord is so that God can have communion with his people. So that his presence can dwell with his people. Now I want you to, now we're moving, we're fast forward into Jesus. Amen. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. See, sin cast them out of the presence of God. God called a man named Abraham and said, I will create a nation out of you. Through that nation, he built a tent where his presence could dwell. He built these articles where the blood could be shed so that his presence could dwell with his people. Now we fast forward to the New Testament and Jesus is full of the presence of the Lord. Within Jesus himself is the presence of God. And now he is upon earth because you see Jesus had no sin. And the presence of God lives in him bodily. Amen. He's like a seed. I know I, I said it recently. Jesus said unless a, unless a seed of wheat is placed into the ground, it remains alone. Jesus was like a seed that and, and through his death, he planted himself in the ground and he produced a harvest. The, he produced a harvest of the presence of God by Jesus' death and resurrection and our faith in that. Now every believer has the presence of God on the inside of them. But look, what I want you to see is this, is that the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. Some of you that have been with us for a long time, y'all remember this version of the Bible? Some of y'all remember the YLT, the Young's Literal Translation. If you look up in the Greek language, the word dwelt right there, look, Young said, I'm going to tell you what the word means, tabernacle. Isn't that something? We were just talking about the tent. We were just talking about the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And what the writer of what John wrote in this gospel, he used a Greek word. You understand that? He, he, he wrote this in Greek. He used a Greek word that meant tabernacle. To describe Jesus becoming flesh. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of, as of an only begotten of a father. Full of grace and full of truth. Amen. Jesus, the glory of God. Tabernacling in him. Jesus. With the presence of God tabernacling with us. Is it, the presence of God is still not in man. But slowly, 
progressively God getting his presence back to his people. Amen? And then Jesus says this when he's about to go to the cross. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Even the spirit of truth. Now he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the presence of God. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not. Neither knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and he shall be in you. I got good news for you, Christian. God's plan worked. Whether or not we're walking in it is another story, but God's plan worked. And what Jesus said is this. Is that you, my disciples, that are Israelites, that have known God, because why? The presence of God has been with you because you've been in the nation of Israel and you know of God. But guess what? He's about to be in you. Well, how is he going to be in me, Jesus? I'm going to tell you. Because when Jesus died on the cross and shed his perfect blood, you see, now when he said it is finished, you got to think about that. See, the blood of bulls and goats cannot completely remove sin. Because, see, it wasn't the blood of a bull or a goat that sinned against God. Does that make sense? It was a man that sinned against God. And it wasn't just any kind of man. It was a man that had no sin. So, therefore, all men born of Adam, ain't none of them can die. You can't die for your own sin, my friend. The Islamic martyr cannot die for his own sin. Why? Because his blood is tainted with sin. There was only one man, two men, I'm sorry, that walked on the face of the earth without sin, but only one died that way. Amen. And Adam walked on the earth without sin, but then he took sin into himself. And now the, he, as the fountainhead of all humanity, all men have received a sinful nature and all men have a desire to go towards something that is sinful. But Jesus, hallelujah, God became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and he had no sin in him. He is the unleavened bread of the Old Testament. He had no yeast. No sin is a yeast is a type of sin. And he offered up that sinless life, that sinless, this is my body, and it shall be broken for you. He offered up that sinless life as payment for the wage of sin. In your place and in my place. And guess what? God accepted it. God accepted it. Because he had no sin. Sin had the wages of sin is death. Sin had no right to hold him down because he had no sin. Amen. So he rose from the dead. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. Because he rose, you and I have hope that we will also rise. Amen. <laughs> so much good stuff here. But the Spirit of God will be in you. How's he going to You mean he's in my buddy at work? But not if he's not saved. He ain't in you if you ain't saved, my friend. This isn't pantheism. The, the Hindu people, some Hindu people believe God is in everything. God is not in a plate of grass. God is the creator of that piece of grass. Amen. That's right. And God is not in you if you are not born again. Amen. You might believe God is real, but until you have bowed your knee to Jesus and put your faith in in the sacrifice of his son and had your sin forgiven and been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, the Holy Spirit cannot live on the inside. Now I want you to see this. So when Jesus is dying on the cross, Matthew 27, 51, when Jesus is dying on the cross, it says, and lo, this is, this is after he has breathed his last breath. It says, and lo, the veil, you remember the veil that we were talking about in the tent? That separated man from the presence of God. And the high priest could only go in there once a year with bringing blood. It says when Jesus died. Check that out. The veil of the sanctuary was rent or ripped in two from top unto bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks were rent. Huh. The Jewish historians say that, the, that this thing was one piece. that was, And when it ripped, it ripped from the top to the bottom. This thing was 30 feet high and like... From what I remember, two hand breadths thick of embroidered material. This thing was ripped when Jesus, God took his hand, <laughs> ripped it. Signifying that the way into the holiest of all had now been made. There's no longer a veil that separates you or stands before you to be able to get into the presence of the Lord. Look at this. Hebrews 10 and 19 talking about the veil. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, talking about the holy place, by the blood of 
Jesus. See, that's what the blood of Jesus did. It removed the veil and it allows you to get into that holiest place beyond the veil where the presence of God lived in the tabernacle, beyond the veil, uh, on top of the mercy seat, between the cherubim, where the blood was applied. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to see this one here. Hebrews 10, 20, by a new and living way, look at this, which he has consecrated for us through his flesh. You see that right there? Jesus' flesh is typed as the veil. Jesus dying, it's like his flesh was ripped for you. Through his death, the veil was opened. Now through his death and faith in his death, you have access, a new and a living way. You know, Lord help us. And, we, and listen, I'm not trying to pick because I'm just as guilty as the next guy. But we can't even hardly roll out of bed 10 minutes early to get into the presence of the Lord. Am I telling the truth? Amen. We can't even hardly roll out of bed in, in five minutes before just to give the Lord thanks. Or five minutes before we go to bed just to give the Lord a little, uh, uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all this work that you've done. You know? Are you much of a worker? Do you, do you, do you understand sometimes that work it, it requires energy? And I understand that God is different than us, but yet at the same time, can you not see the work that he's been doing? Can you not see how he's done this on purpose to get our attention? Amen? And I want you to know that in his presence, there's a whole lot for you and I. Amen? That's, he's done all of this. This is all the teaching just to bring you to the end here to explain to you. that what is, Okay, what does it mean for me, preacher? What does it mean for me today, right now, that God did all this stuff? He built all these tents. He caused all this stuff to happen to get his presence. I'm going to tell you. Because, because in his presence, there's that you can have joy. The, the effect of what God has done, you can have joy. In the midst of your turmoil, in the midst of your trial, in the midst of chaos, you can still have joy. Because it's not you producing it, it's God's presence producing it in you. There is hope in his presence. There is freedom in his presence. There is healing in his presence. There is victory in his presence. Amen. There is wisdom in his presence. I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful for wisdom. If we just stop long enough just to listen a little bit. He's trying to speak to us, my friend. He's speaking deep down inside your belly. I'm telling you, he is. Sometimes the noise of the world, the logic of our mind, it gets in the way. He's trying to contend with us. And he's trying to say, no, don't do that. Go this way. I know it doesn't make sense to everybody around you. But I'm not the same as this world that you live in. There's guidance in his presence. Look at this right here. There's peace in his presence. And look at this. What is it that you need? <laughs> what is it that you need? Because whatever it is that you need today, his presence can I'm telling you right now, his presence can provide. This is an anchor right here. I didn't even put this right here, but when I looked at an anchor, this isn't even really what the scripture's saying, kind of, sort of is. But when I think of an anchor like that in a storm, I think of stability. You know, his presence can provide you stability in the midst of a chaotic world. But listen, step outside of his presence and see what it looks like, my friend. You're going to be like a boat, a little bitty boat, a rudderless Little bitty boat, tall because you because you know why? Because you're just a little bitty man, and you're just a little bitty woman, and he's a big old guy in a big old mean world. You, you we ain't near as big as what we think we are. And without the presence of the Lord, without the compass of the Lord, without the stability of the Lord, you're gonna be like a little bitty boat without a rudder, being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, tossed on the waves of life, and not being able to head into the right direction. And there's the lighthouse right there, trying to protect you and trying to bring you into a safe harbor. But it's like, oh no, that's life far away. I don't want to go towards that light. I think I'll go towards this. No, let me tell you something. The presence of the Lord will give you stability. But you gotta want God. You got to want the presence of the Lord. You got to want the wisdom of God. Look at this scripture. Hebrews 6, 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. That's a beautiful picture to me because you see, again, the veil terminology. You see why it's so important to understand all that older stuff? Because when you understand that older stuff and you just wake up one morning and your scripture verse for the day is Hebrews 6, 19. And you read that, and if you take the time and just not read, oh, I got my, my verse out of the way, and you try to ponder it. Which hope we have? 
What, what? You got hope in the Lord is what he's trying to say. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both sure and steady. Who's your anchor? This whole book right here of Hebrews is talking about Jesus. Sure and steadfast and which enters into that within the veil. Jesus is your anchor, my friend. Jesus has gone through the veil so that you can get into the veil. And that this anchor for your soul. Could you imagine like there's an anchor hooked up on that Ark of the Covenant on the inside. And, and, the, and the veil. And you can't even see. And, and, and you know you're over here on this storm tossed ocean. You ever been on a boat out in the Gulf? <clears throat> Probably most of y'all have. I used to, I was on a work boat in the Gulf. I used to work on a work boat. And sometimes we tie up on these nylon ropes. And they say that these ropes can stretch about two-thirds its length before it pops. I don't know. But I'm talking about like huge vessels, 160 foot, 180 foot, big old work vessels. That's big old weight there. And we tie up to the rig on these ropes. And then a storm would come. And you have like six-foot waves, seven-foot waves. And it's like that boat would travel up on the wave. And then it would just slam. And then that, that rope that had slack in it would like pow. And, and sometimes they break, but they wouldn't. And it was like, it was anchored to that rig. And it's kind of like I imagine this anchor on the inside of the veil. And then here I am and tied to this rope that's anchored. And this world is full of chaos and the storms of life are raging. But guess what? I'm anchored to, the, to Jesus. I, he's my, what is it that I'm going to face today or tomorrow that he can't get me through? No, he's the anchor of my soul. Amen. I'm just trying to let you know. If you need stability in your life, quit trying to figure it out on your own, man. Quit trying to do it your own way. Go back to the word of the Lord. Go back to the presence of the Lord. Let God speak to you. Let God speak to me and let us walk according to his ways and his will and not this old dirty world. This old filthy world. Come on, somebody. Have you been in Christianity long enough to figure out that this world is broken and chaotic and filthy and diseased with sin? That's what it is. Oh, I don't like your, your adjectives, preacher. Guess what? I, everything I just said was true. This world is dirty and filthy and it's diseased with sin because sin is running rampant and mankind lets it. But guess what? There's something good on this earth. You know what's good on this earth? You, if Jesus lives in you. <laughs> if Jesus lives in you, there's something good on this earth. The Lord's still got a footprint on this earth. His presence is here. Amen. Amen. Let's move forward. Look, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Amen. The presence of God will bring liberty and freedom into your life. I love this psalm right here. I used to quote this psalm almost every day. Thinking about it in my heart. One thing have I desired. You know, so many times we have so many desires. But one day I was reading this psalm. And, and listen, it doesn't even come alive till the Lord brings it alive in our heart, right? It's not like, it's not, oh, the, the preacher's really holy and arrived. I wish I could be, now you don't want to be like me. If it wouldn't be for the grace of God, I couldn't even see the beauty in it. But because of the grace of God, I can, I can see the beauty in it. One thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will I seek after. What are you seeking after today, Christian? Or non-Christian? What, what are you seeking after? What are the goals of your life? This one thing, well, I, I got to have this one thing. I got to get to a place where I can play golf every day. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm making fun, but what, what, what are you seeking after, man? I, I, I'm going to get to this place in my life where I can do this, and then I will find happiness and serenity. This is what I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That's what the psalmist said. This one thing do I desire to be in the presence of God. I don't know about you, but Lord, make my heart to line up with this. I want to be in your presence, Lord. I think this is my last little scripture. Maybe the musicians and the singers can come. I always want to go out of the house. I know I preach long now. Forgive me. I don't know that I really need forgiveness because we only come to church twice a week and I don't know that we really have enough time. We're going to have church for three hours a day. Thank you. Thank you. At least I got one out there. Yeah. <laughs> Exodus 33, 15 through 16. And he said unto him, this is Moses. You know, this. Is, how humble is this? God has commissioned Moses to do a great thing to lead his people. And look what the Lord, look what Moses says. He said unto him, 
If your presence mm. goes not with me, carry us not up from here. Yes. Lord, I, I'm willing to do what you're calling me to do. I, I want to do what you're calling me to do. But if your presence isn't going to go with us, please, please don't. Please don't bring us. Please don't bring us, Lord. For wherein shall it be known here that I and your people have found grace in your sight? Is it not that in you go with us? So shall we be separated, I and your people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. I mean, really, you got to think about that. This whole message has been about the presence of God and the difference, really, between God, what the enemy's trying to do to this world and do to God's, God's kingdom, right? And Moses had a revelation. Moses said, Lord, I want to do what you're calling me to do. But if your presence isn't with me, I don't want to go. Because if that's the only thing that, that separates us. That's the only thing that makes us different than the world around us. It's the presence of God. Amen? And when the presence of God is with us, look, he says your presence separates us. Your presence makes us different than the other people that are on the face of the earth. You, you cannot afford the Christian to live without the presence of God. I know it took me a long time to get there, but the main thing I wanted you to see is this. God has been working for you. God has been working for you, and he's been working for me to get his presence back to us. And now, we just gotta believe it. And we gotta want to seek after his presence. Praise God. Let's worship. If you need prayer,